want to thank the organizers for inviting me here, and thank you for coming to the talk. Uh, this talk is, as I said, a booster population on random graphs. In particular, I will focus on booster population on the uh, random graph. Uh, this is based on joint work with Tamas Matai, a postdoc of mine at TU Graz. So what is a uh, booster population? Uh, so it work. Uh, booster population on a graph, given a graph, and we also given a so-called infection threshold, R, which is a, a natural number. Uh, what we do is that we start from a so-called a set of initially infected vertices. So we know that there is a set of initially infected vertices. And then in each step, every uninfected, uninfected vertices uh, becomes infected if it has at least R infected neighbors. It's a kind of a deterministic process. As I said, in each step we infect everything if it has R infected neighbors. And once it is, it is a, a vertex become infected, it becomes infected forever. Mm -hmm. And this poster population on the graph has been introduced a long time ago on Betty Lattice. Perhaps the physicists know better about Betty Lattice in the context of a uh, disorder system, but I will not talk about it because <coughs> I don't know much about it. But then the dependency between the final set of infected vertices on the set of the, the size of the set of initially infected vertices has, has been studied a lot. So how big should be the uh, initially infected vertex set so that perhaps almost all the vertices become infected in the end, or maybe only a small number of additional vertices might be infected, depending on the size of the initial, initially infected vertex set. And this has been studied a lot on infinite trees, finite grid, and also random graphs, such as random regular graphs. We have seen a lot of nice results on the random regular graphs in this conference, and also the Edos Rennie random graph, GNP, or the so-called binomial random graph, GNP. And as well as inhomogeneous random graph, and sometimes we call here in this community stochastic block models in a very, very general setting. But in this talk, I will focus on the Edos Rennie graph setting in GNP. As I said, we have a freedom of the, uh, the infection threshold. So let's say R equals 1. What happens? To just do the sanity check. When R equals 1, <coughs> uh, it's kind of simple. Given every vertex, if, if it has at least one infected neighbor, it will become infected because the infection threshold is 1. As a, as a, as a result, uh, a, a component containing a uh, any component containing a, at least one infected vertex will become eventually infected. What does that mean is that any component contain, containing a, a, at least one infected vertex will eventually infect it. It's kind of a, easy to analyze. Therefore, from now on, I will focus on the case when the R, the infection threshold, is at least two. And throughout the talk, I will denote by A the Initially, the set of initially infected vertices of given size, say A, and which will be chosen uniformly random among all the sets of vertices of given size A. But of course, by symmetry, we can take any deterministic set of that size. So without loss of generality, I will assume that A, the initially infected set, will be the set of integers 1 through A. And A of F, or S sub F, will, we will denote the final set of infected vertices. As I said, a lot of study has been made between the, the relation or the behavior of the final set or the size of the final set versus the size of the initial set. So as the, the, this conference is about phase transition, so natural question is, is there a phase transition in terms of that? Or, or is there any threshold phenomena? If so, what is the critical value? And if so, then what is the width of the critical window? This kind of thing has been studied, among others, by Janssen, Ucha, Trova, and Valle. So there are other works, but I will just focus on this one, as I would like to talk more 
on in this event. One other thing that they have shown, indeed, this is a dramatic simplification of their wonderful work. More than 50 pages of the paper I just put on this one slide. Um, is the, among other things, what they show is the following. So we say we fixed the R infection threshold. We fixed the size of the infection, initially infected set. What we can vary in this world is the probability distribution, so edge probability P. If the edge probability P is at least n to the minus, uh, so 1 over n, uh, much, much. The initial set size uh, it's, not, it's, uh, it's not fixed. It will also be a parameter. So what you can imagine the fixed R, I will fix P satisfying this range. I fix P, so I, I, I indeed I, there are two models. Did you ask question correctly? And because I was messing with indeed. So there, there can be two models when you want to change something. You can fix R and P and change the size of A. Or you, you fix R and P, no, no, sorry, A and change the P. I will talk about the model where I will fix P and change A. Yeah, there are two models, but I think I messed up. But you are, thank you. So now, Fix, fix P, satisfying this. So 1 over n, it's much, much larger, well, larger than 1 over n, but much, much smaller than n to the power of minus 1 over r. If it any such P, what we can show is that with high probability, there is a threshold, A critical, such that if the size of the initial infected set is smaller than A critical, then only a few additional vertices are infected, I just to deal with it in this session, although as I said, it's much more is known. On the other hand, if the size of the initial infected set is larger than AC, A critical, then with a high probability, almost every vertex becomes infected, yeah, in the sense that the final set is the of order n minus little of n. And as I said, I overly simplify the result. Indeed, we do know the explicit formula for the A critical the critical size of the initial infected set, as well as the width. Width will be the square root of the critical value. So we know almost everything. But as I said, the results hold with high probability. On the other hand, I didn't write here the result. It's not that because it's, it's boring, but bec because it, has to, it does have a different behavior and, and kind of simpler. So let BR is now at least 2. And for example, when P is equal to a big O of n to the minus 1, we know that the GNP consists of either only of small components, if the P is much smaller than 1 over n, or if its average degree is bounded, let's say D, then we do have a giant component and a lot of small components. So still what is clear is that in this regime, we do have lots of small components. So in order to infect almost every vertex, it's clear that we have to infect, we have to start with the vertices which are infected and lies on each of these small components. So, maybe I'm not talking about this. so like in this picture, in order to infect almost everything in this regime, as I said, because it consists of so many small components, we have to start with almost every vertex infected everything in that component. Of course, when P is, uh, P, uh, if the graph has average degree, constant average degree, it's, it's a little bit more sophisticated, but nevertheless, you, you, should, you can show that in order to have uh, almost every vertex being infected, you have to start with almost every vertex infected initially. So in this regime, so we had the two kind of uh, constraints, and now in this regime, why this regime is kind of separate? So let's say in this regime, Theta of n to the minus 1 over r. If you look at it, so say this is a set of infected vertices. And look at a, a vertex and check whether there are at least r infected neighbors. Uh, of course, we can easily check the number of number of infected neighbors, so number of vertices. Expected number of vertices, sorry, with at least R infected neighbors, infected neighbors, we can compute easily. Neighbors. We can comp 
compute it easily because it's sort of binomial coefficient. This is roughly n times. So I have n minus uh, infected vertices. If we, we are in the initial case, then it's almost n times p to the r. But on the other hand, we are in this regime, so this is just constant. So we have a constant number of expected number of vertices, which has at least r infected neighbors with constant probability. Maybe we will infect such vertices. On the other one can show that indeed, if you start with the uh, initial set of infected vertices of constant size, if this constant is at least r, then with the positive probability, there will be a, a almost all population, meaning almost every vertex becomes connected. It's kind of a rather easier consequence. And if you're looking at it in this regime, if the p is much, much larger than n to the minus 1 over r, now this quantity becomes infinity. On the other hand, you can also show using other methods that indeed also any initial set of constant size eventually spread to the entire set with high probability. So there is an interesting regime here as well, but as I said, I, I will focus on this regime. We want to improve this part. As I said, much of the results are known, as I will show you in the next slide. But our target is to show this not with high probability, but exponentially high probability. One of the motivation was because Valier asked us to do that in some conference. Because we had other results, and then he asked us whether we can do this also for GNP. And we walked a little bit and played a little bit. And in the end, by surprising, surprisingly, there were very elementary mathematics to show this. So all, from now on, the formulas may look complicated. The mathematics behind it will be very elementary. So now we fix R is at least 2. P, as I said, the most interesting regime. P is much, much larger than n to the 1 minus 1 and much, much smaller than n to the minus 1 over r. Now I will show you uh, many technically looking quantities, but I will explain later. Hopefully, uh, we'll be able to explain how these quantities appear naturally. The first thing will be our kind of a time, t0. I will explain also why, why this time is this quantity, 1 plus delta, which will influence the kind of a failure probability later times. 1 minus r factorial <coughs> divided by n times r power of p to the 1 over r minus 1. As I said, I, will, I promise that I will show you why these quantities appear. Here, delta, we want to wish to make it as small as possible because it will be influencing the, the exponential failure bound. But the way we, we make our proof so elegant, I mean, very short proof, we had to use the result on giant component in order to apply that particular technique we have some restriction, it's technical restriction. So delta should be uh, larger than n times p to the r. Because of the restriction, we know that this quantity tends to 0. But then we raise to the power 1 over 2 times r of r minus 1. And it should be larger than n times p. Now n times p is a growing number. So I, we put some negative power, minus 1 over 4 times r minus 1. As I said, due to the condition on p, this delta is nevertheless little of 1. As I said, we want to make it as small as possible, but this is what we can do. Then there are two other quantities that are more essential to define it. We need the, the probability that binomial distribution with parameters t and p is at least r, which I denoted by pi of t. Then, I was telling this acritical. The critical value for <coughs> the phase transition in terms of the size of the final set is this quantity, so minimum minus minimum of n times pi of t minus t divided by 1 minus pi of t. Oh. Why did that appear naturally? You will see later, as I said, I promised. Which, if you compute it, this is approximately of this number. You see, this quantity is appearing there and here as well. It's all the same. And t critical is the smallest t where this, in, this minimum is reached. So if you compute it, you will see that this quantity appears everywhere, as I said. But this, nevertheless, is much, much smaller than p to the minus 1. Yeah, as I said, hopefully I will be able to show you why these quantities appear naturally. But if we work on some so-called r core problem, the maximal subgraph of a graph whose minimum degree is at least r, you will see that 
Not exactly this formula, but something similar formula might appear. So when you analyze this one, you might wonder whether this has to do with the R core of the final infection set, but I think there is a relation, but up to now I cannot formulate it in a most elegant way. Nevertheless, to state the theorem, uh, let omega zero be any function which is much, much larger than the window, size of the window, the width of the window, namely square root of AC. Then if the size of the initially infected, the initially infected set is equal to AC, so A critical, minus omega zero, if you want to reread it, of course you can read it as, as like set, size of the set minus <coughs> criticality normalized by the size of the window, you can also read it in this fashion. Huh? Then, with a high probability, I will read it later, the size of the final infection set is, is at most t-critical. As I said, indeed, on the other hand, we can show not only with high probability, with exponentially high probability, to be with one minus, one minus is missing, sorry. <laughs> one minus. <coughs> so one minus x of minus some constant times square of the omega zero divided by t zero. So the reason why I didn't write in this fashion as the Janssen, Uchak, Toroba, and Valia did is we want to quantify this failure problem. <laughs> Just write the failure problem. Sorry for that. One minus x. Yeah, so to capture this uh, failure probability, we had this. This, this, this speed of, of the convergence, and this influenced this failure probability, and furthermore, this T0 is also influencing our failure probability. On the other hand, as you can imagine, the other way around, when this quantity tends to positive infinity, then what Janssen et al. showed is that with high probability, the size of the final set is n minus little or of n, so we improved it by showing this exponential bound. Again, this quantity, the constants are different. We have a la rather lengthy, ugly formula, but very explicit formula. And again, this failure probability depends on this omega zero, square of the omega zero divided by t zero. By looking at it, you might see why we plug in this one. So if we want to have a better smaller failure probability, we wish to have delta very small. Yeah. We believe that this is not optimal indeed. We can do better. But as I said, the proof is really elegant using this powerful theorem by Bolobash and Riordan, and therefore we have this unwished bound on delta. But if you want to improve it, maybe you can have different approach. So let me say a few words about the proof, how we should prove it. Yeah. So you're saying AC coincides with the, with these parameters NPR, with the size of the R core? Uh, not exactly. That R core, not R core of the GNP, but I think R core of the, if I have known, if I'm a god, I don't, I don't have a religion, but if there is a god, <laughs> then I will know the final set of the infection, final infected set. Then, this will be the R core of that one. But of course, we are just a baby. We don't know the structure. We just don't know, but we are just talking about the size, not even the structure. So why I'm talking about it is that if I look at this proof, how, how it goes, or how we prove it, it does mimic the so-called warning propagation thing that I have done with Armin Goya Oglan recently. Where is Catherine? With Catherine Scoops as well. It, uh, it is not exactly the same, but it kind of, gives me a feeling that it has to do with it. But the problem is that I don't know the final structure of the final set, whether I can correlate with very nice Galton Mason tree, not with the average degree D, uh, <laughs> but I have to contract it. So it has some loose connection, but I don't know the connection. That's the annoying part. Yeah? So I have two questions. So one is, is the exponential rate of decay, do you think that's the best possible? No. <laughs> As I said, it's the proof. The second one, I don't quite understand this one plus delta discussion. So if delta is equal to one, yeah. why does it matter what the delta is? Yeah. Delta is kind of a, some fixed number. I can also say not equal, but I can also make it as small as possible. If I wish, if I can prove it. But as I said, 
one part, indeed the, the most elegant part of the proof uses a Zion component. I have to put this thing in the weekly supercritical regime. And this is just technical thing. I mean, look at this one. This is on the bottom. The smaller T0 is, the better. I, I wish to make delta to be zero. Yeah. Delta can be zero. If, if delta is zero, then I will be completely happy because it matched to my T critical time where the threshold appears. Now I will be very, but I have to go a little bit further. This TC is indeed the, is the, the lower bound of the infected set at time TC. At time TC, the number of vertices that are infected will be at least TC. Now TC, but any time T, I will show you I, I, in, the, in the proof it's hidden, any time T, T, I haven't talked about this time, but each step I was talking about each step, there was the step, whatever the step was, and you will see that, as I said, if T0 was not T0 but TC, you see, from this one we, we, we went a little bit further, so that we have a sharper concentration. So my wish is that if delta is zero, I will be very happy. We can discuss later. Yeah. No, just about the, the, the connection with uh, the core, the core calculation. Yeah. If the graph were uh, regular, then there is an exact duality between bootstrap percolation and the dynamics of uh, the reduction to the R core. Not to the R core, to the de degree minus R core. But here, you are in a regime where the degrees are very much concentrated. Yeah. So if you approximate this by, I mean, if you approximate the NP by, a, by a, a regular graph. Regular graph with uh, uh, infinity, degree infinity, yeah? Well, degree, okay. what it should be, I mean, uh, P times P times N, yeah. P times N. And, uh, and then it's quite natural to have the connection with the... Uh, but on the other hand, if the degree is unbounded, the Galton, so what I was saying is that there is a very elegant approach to the K-core problem through the galton wasn't tree with multi-type galton wasn't tree indeed. It's not single type, but multi-type to remember whether the vertex is in the core or not. So we're really, really, it's a kind of beautiful thing. I wanted to apply it, but the point is that there we have to use this local structure, namely the GNP with the bounded degree can be approximated by the galton wasn tree. But if your degree is unbounded, it's not anymore true because <coughs> of the correlations between the things. So. I don't know whether there will be this elegant, this super elegant uh, multi-type Galton wasn't tree <laughs> associated, but as well, thank you for <coughs> mentioning it. So, uh, okay, I, I was not saying that it was a way to prove it, but to, a way to feel that it was quite natural. That the yeah, it is, it, yeah, exactly. So if you if you work on this Keiko things, if you look at this, you will see, oh yeah, oh my God, this is this this function that is appearing all the time. Yeah, not only conceptually, but also quantitatively, analytically, if you see this function, it's kind of, oh, bubble. There should be connection. And, and as you said, there's a loose connection. Good, so this is about all this technical statement. As I said, I just highlight this blue thing, the reason being that if uh, Svante is watching this video, <laughs> so that he doesn't complain. So the, all, most of the things which is written as black is almost the same as Janssen or Chaktorova Valier, except that they don't use the binomial, but they use the Boisson, of course. We know that Boisson and binomial are rel very close relatives. But it's some, if you look at the windows inside, but sometimes they make difference, but in this particular case, it doesn't make any difference. So we change, twist it a little bit but asymptotically they are the same. And also, instead of this one minus exponential uh, probably, they have this with high probability, with additive error terms. So, so, the rest of the talk, I want to give you some ideas about the proof, as I already said several times, that it's really short and elegant proof, or elementary proof. Uh, we will use the reformulation due to Scali and Tomba. Um, and then we will set up some martingale <coughs> so that we can have the number of infected vertices is concentrated around its mean with exponentially high probability in the early stage of the process. It's, it's true only at the early stage of the process. And in the subcritical case, because the number of infected vertices will be small enough, so can just imply, we can apply this martingale <coughs> concentration result to the subcritical case. On the other hand, for the supercritical case, I have a lot of typo indeed. So I was changing this morning and 
So indeed, I planned this talk to be a blackboard talk, and I realized there is no blackboard and there is a whiteboard, <laughs> and then there was no shifting up and down, so I decided to make it quick. So sorry for this, all these typos. <laughs> yeah. <so> anyway, <laughs> it's an early morning, the brain thing. Uh, and the supercritical regime, because we want to go further, the martingale concentration is not strong enough. The reason is that in the supercritical case, we already infect at least a T0 vertices, whatever the number was. And then, because then the probability that the martingale is sufficiently concentrated decreases dramatically once we reach this T0 infected numbers. So we have to do something more. On the other hand, we have infected enough number of vertices, then comes this elegant thing. What is it? It's the subgraph uh, spanned by vertices with exactly r minus 1 infected neighbors grows so that it contains the largest component. I have a largest component. It's not yet linear size, but kind of a p to the minus 1 size. Once any vertex in this giant component is infected, every vertex in the giant component will be infected. As I said, the size of the giant is not yet linear, but on the other hand, <coughs> you can just uh, make uh, the other vertices infected quickly using Chernoff. So that's my plan, so how it works. As I said, I promised that I will do some reformulation. It looks very technical, therefore I will use just a black, uh, white board. What is written, you don't need to read it. We will examine the, the infected vertices one by one and determine the vertices that has exactly our neighbors in the previously examined vertices. This is written and we denote by z of t to be the set of the examined vertices, a of t be the number of uh, vertices that are infected. So what is it? Yeah, so as I said, forget about it. So given a time t, we have a set, set t. Let's say z t minus 1 to describe a z of t. I will do this in each step. And if, if there are infected <coughs> vertices that has not, been, not yet been examined, as, as I said, the set of vertices that are infected, I will denote by f t, infected vertices at time t minus 1 and set the number of vertices, uh, set of vertices that are examined among infected <coughs> vertices. If there is an additional vertex which does not lie in ZT minus 1, but lies in T minus 1, so that are infected but not yet examined, let's call it UT. You can select it in arbitrary manner as you wish. You select one vertex in the difference, and you, you include it in your set, and you call this new set as Z of T. So the set of vertices that are examined. And what you do then, and outside the world, that are not initially infected, it doesn't matter whether they are infected or not, but I ignore them, I just look at all the vertices that were not infected initially, all the vertices up to n minus a, so that is just n, and check whether it has r minus 1 infected neighbors. Am I doing correct? Yes. At least R neighbors in the examined vertices. Not in fact, it's indeed in infected, but examined the vertices. So what I have done here is the, I want to associate this quantity with some indicator random variable. I put it one. If the vertex A i plus A plus i has at least R neighbors in Z, T, the examine the vertices, otherwise a zero. Then I'm ready to define A of T. So A of T, the set of the infected vertices at time T, will just be the union of the <coughs> initially infected set. So initially infected set, I set the A, so one through A. Union of the vertices that has at least R neighbors in Z. This is what is written here. Then it is easy to see that Z of T, the examined vertices, the set of the examined vertices will be the 
a subset of a strictly subset of the A of T, the infected set, that's how we define it. And we set the large T be the minimum time T such that the, the infected set is identical to the examined set. Why? Because if there is no vertices which is infected but not yet examined, I have no vertices to examine, therefore the population stops there. There will be no further infections once we reach that point. This is identical to the minimum t such that the cardinality of A of t is equal to t. So each time we examine one vertex, so at time t we, will have, we have examined all the infected vertices and this is target function and the final set of infected vertices will be identical to A of t. So this has been used also in the Janson et al. paper, and I promise that I will show you some, some numbers where all these strange computations occur, because it's kind of a very simple, uh, I, may, I may not do because the time is running out. Oh, do, how much time do I have? Only 10 minutes? It seems like it. Yeah, so I skip it, why this all contact is up here. It's a really cute, just calculus, but I just move on to the martingale. If you look at it, if you look at what's going on is that in each step, in worst case, in A of T, we might infect N minus A of T vertices in single step. In worst case, of course, but it might happen. In the early stage of the process that we are targeting for martingale, A of t is usually little o of n. So in worst case, we might just infect in one step n minus little o of n vertices. Yes, but if you work on martingale concentration inequalities, of course, the most important thing is the maximal one step difference. If it's linear, you, we don't have any hope to have a very sharp concentration. So we have to refine this martingale. This is how we do in this picture. What is going on is the following. We distinguish the vertices. This, I will read this part first, before defining this quantity, because it looks terribly complicated, but it's not. So this quantity was just the, the same that, look at the vertex I plus A plus I, and check whether it has R at least our neighbors in Z of T. We will refine this, just looking one by one vertices until A plus I, we check it. For four vertex, after that, A plus I plus one, yeah, that's it written here. For the vertex A plus I plus one on, what we will do is that we will check whether it has R, at least R neighbors in Z T minus one. <coughs> This is very technical matter, but it helps us a lot. Now we have this quantity up to here. We use this nice x time ti. But up to here, up from here on, we will use the examined set in one step below uh, j, yeah, j, because j can run anything. So this is where it's written here. What is written here, we set up some, some random variable, mti. So this pair will define a total ordering using the lexicographical order. So for any such, which is non-zero, so it is kind of a trivial low bound condition, we define the random variable m to be the sum of the random variable xtj, where j runs from one through i, and check whether it has r at least our neighbors in ZT, minus pi hat of T, this is almost a binomial, except the stopping time condition, divided by one minus pi, uh, pi hat of T. Plus, we check the rest of the world for those J larger than A plus I, whether it has at least our neighbors in the previous step in ZT minus one, and you do this. Then one thing that is easy is that the cardinality of A of T, I just read it off from here. It was, cardinality is the size of the set A, zero, so it was A, plus indicator random variables, yeah, from here. On the other hand, using this quantity, 
by taking the last one, n minus a, this sum disappears, what is left is here. So you do the, just a little arithmetic, the first year calculus, even the high school students can do that. So if you do this, you obtain this one. Why this is nice? We understand very well the binomial random variable. Of course, it's a stopped binomial random variable, but we understand it very well. It's highly concentrated. And m, this new random variable, if it does have nice behavior, then we are done. It does have a nice behavior. Indeed, the sequence of random variables m, 0, n minus a through the end forms a martingale. Uh, just to make sure, I wrote down the definition of martingale, but maybe in this community, I don't need to explain it. So it does form a martingale. And you can use a standard martingale inequality, but on the other hand, there is a very nice one due to Chang and Lu, which extends the result of the McDermott. It's quite powerful for our purpose. So we use that, and we get the martingale concentration. For the subcritical case, we are almost done, as I promised. Uh, the reason is that if you look at the A critical, which was defined, I just rewrote the de definition using the T critical. It's just the quantity that I have written there. And also A of TC, we know. So the number of infected vertices at the critical time, we know. And we do just a little arithmetic. Then in the end, we get that the number of infected vertices until critical time is smaller than critical time with exponentially high probability. So as I said, using the constant, I hide this constant, but there was also other term. This is kind of a very technically looking inequality indeed. So subcritical case was quite easy. <coughs> so now supercritical case, it, it's indeed nice. So I will just use a picture to prove it. You do not need to read it. As I said, this is the kind of the, the part that I like most. The martingale inequality in the subcritical case is not yet enough. But nevertheless, it does produce a huge set of infected vertices of size as I said, at least t0 plus omega 0 over 2. And I divide this set into parts, namely my examined set of vertices, it's quite huge, and little reservoir for later purposes. I call it A1, because it's too lengthy, and this part A2, size of the A2 is, is about omega 0 over 4. So this part, as a reservoir, I keep it. Then what we do is, you look at the set of vertices outside of that world, and check whether it has exactly all minus 2 neighbors, I minus one, sorry, neighbors in there, and I call it B hat. And it's written there. Set of vertices which has exactly <coughs> I minus one neighbors in that examined vertices up to time, T0 plus omega zero over four. Then, it's not yet uh, IID random variable, some of the IID random variable of that one, but on the other hand, the the number of vertices that has that many neighbors is stochastically dominating some nice binomial random variable. And therefore, we can also say the size of the set in a very nice manner, and indeed the size of the set is 1 plus epsilon times p to the minus 1. Of course, epsilon is hiding all these dirty constant or quantities depending on n, omega 0, and delta. Nevertheless, if you look closely how this epsilon is defined or behaving, we can show that this is in the so-called weakly critical regime of the GNP. And it does contain a giant component B of size, of this size, so it does contain a giant component of size almost 2 epsilon over 1 plus 2 epsilon P inverse. What is the good thing about it is that we do not have only with a high probability result, but also exponentially high probability result due to with exponentially high probability due to Bolobashian Riordan will appear this year, hopefully. So he has done, they have done all the work that I need. 
yeah. thanks to them, although we were trying to prove it and they were quicker. So due to other reasons, indeed, they wanted to apply this result to the local limit theorem for the giant component. Uh, nevertheless, so using this one, we can guarantee that with high probability uh, there is a giant component. It's not yet. It's not yet big enough. So what is one can show is that once a single vertex here is connected to, connected to additional infected vertices, then it has exactly R neighbors that are infected. Therefore, this vertex will be infected. But since this vertex will yeah, spread the infection through the whole component, this B will be completely infected. So now we have a giant infected set. It's not yet enough. As I said, the size is still not far away from N, N which we are targeting for. So what we can do is we just kind of a repeat what we know. You check the set C, whether it has R, at least R neighbors in B. Before I came here, I gave a talk in Oberwolfach two weeks ago. At that time, we repeat this business there if some of you are in the, in the talk. So we just look at r minus one neighbors here and then we check whether there is additional vertex here, but we don't need to do that indeed. We can just do honest check whether this, the, the vertices outside these two has at least r neighbors in B. It does have with exponentially high probability. Furthermore, the size of this will be at least delta minus one, p minus one. It's not yet close to n, so what can you do? You just repeat. You check whether outside the world has at least our neighbors in the infected set. Yes, it does. D, the size of the D is as we wished, n minus a little of n, we can show using the Chernoff, Chernoff, Chernoff. And of course, D is contained in the final infected set, and we are done. And as I said, very simple proof for rather complicated looking result. Thank you very much for your attention. Questions?